first, uh, our first presentation today is the keynote, and it's building a Vermont Forest Resource Network, the need for increased coordination and cooperation among disciplines and across organizations. And our presenter is John Erickson. John is a professor of ecological economics and the interim dean of the Rubenstein School. He has published widely on energy and climate change policy, land conservation, watershed planning, environmental public health, and the theory and practice of ecological economics. John is also an Emmy award-winning producer of films such as a four-part PBS series, Bloom, on the sources and solutions of nutrient pollution on Lake Champlain. He is a Fulbright Scholar and Managing Director of UVM's Gun Institute, and currently serves on the Governor's Council on Energy and the Environment. John completed his PhD at Cornell University and was on the economics faculty at RPI before joining the University of Vermont in 2002. So please help me welcome John Erickson. Constantly, right? We're collaborating all the time. Um, 
every grant that we write that has all the stuff in there about collaboration. Um, I don't know that that's a credible, a, a credible thing. We're not collaborating more because we collaborate enough already. Um, but believe it or not, we hear that a lot. Um, we, we certainly hear a lot about how much collaboration we're doing. I certainly hear that a lot from our faculty. Like, what do you want from me, really? Because of time, because of money, because of silos, um, uh, we, we couldn't possibly collaborate more. So that's an important one to keep in mind. Number nine, it's kind of a winner-takes-all society, right? Second place is the first loser. Have you seen that bumper sticker? Um, <laughs> Certainly uh, on the academic side of the fence, and I think as you get higher and higher up in, in all of your organizations, these are folks that um, grew up, you know, kind of competitive <laughs> and um, went through pretty uh, crazy programs. I myself went to school at, at Cornell University and it was a, a really competitive environment. I was taught uh, a lot of skills about the importance of being an individual. And a lot of the rewards that I was given throughout my career was about the importance of being an individual, right? And if I'm going to collaborate, it damn well better be to promote me, right? <laughs> because second place is the first loser. Um, and I'm going to compete for grants, and I'm going to compete for publications, and I'm going to compete for the very best classroom at, at UVM to teach it. And I'm going to compete for the best students to advise, right? You, you get what I'm saying? It's not a, exactly a, a, a collaborative <laughs> environment in our various organizations. And I'm speaking largely from an academic organization, but I think we can draw parallels to others as well. Um, another one that we hear a lot is that breadth comes at the expense of depth, right? We're not all Mr. T. We're not all T-shaped people where we're broad and deep. And the broader we get, the shallower we are, right? We hear that a lot. Um, that we just, you know, you just can't afford to get too broad, too much of a generalist, because you won't be credible, you won't have an expertise in something, you won't really have that grounding in an area. And um, it, it makes, it, it's a challenge for collaboration if, if, if we've got lots of kind of I-shaped people and no T-shaped people. Or we've got some T-shaped people, but they have to sort of a, have to um, follow a different reward structure, a different system, play by different rules than all the I-shaped people. So um, I, I love the A-team. I love Mr. T. I think we need more T-shaped people, uh, and, and this breadth at the expense of depth. I'm not sure that we can afford that excuse anymore. I'll talk more about that in a minute. The comfort of the comfort zone. Right? This is really an innovative approach, but I'm afraid we can't consider it's never been done before. Um, I think we, we get that a lot when we, we try to collaborate, when we try to talk, someone yelled out silos, right? The, the sort of uncomfortableness of talking across silos, of learning somebody else's language, of learning the assumptions of their field, of trying to come to terms with their perspective and your perspective. That often comes back to questioning your own assumptions, right? Your own field, the, the worth of your own career. And it's like, oh my god, this is too scary. It's not comfortable at all. Please leave me alone. Um, so the comfort of the comfort zone, I think, is, is a lot of why maybe we don't collaborate more. Um, something we hear a lot about is, you know, more studies required, right? One more study. Um, I will collaborate once I know the answer to my piece of the puzzle. I will collaborate once I know everything there is to know about my subject. I will collaborate once I am an expert. Um, I, I can't, I, I, this is, a, a group like this really has to sort of push back on that and sort of say, when do you, when do you know enough to start to make a decision? When do you know enough to reach across <coughs> into, into that silo? When do you know enough so especially break that distance that we often have between our educational institutions and our government and our nonprofit organizations. So um, more study required is certainly a reason for not collaborating. I don't know if it's good enough. Um, a bunch of people yelled out money, funding. Very true. The incentives for collaboration are, are a key part of this, right? Number five on the list. Um, and again, the incentive structure historically has been to kind of reward the individual to reward the individual effort, to reward first place. 
Uh, the incentive structure is something that we struggle on, we struggle with uh, between institutions. We really struggle with the incentive structure between disciplines. We're not very good at setting up reward structures that encourage risk taking, that encourage interdisciplinary effort, that encourage you to publish not in your field. Oh my God, right? I mean, that, that is a scary thing for a lot of people because especially early in your career is that that kind of risk taking and the kind of higher, higher failure rate of not publishing in your field um, is, is a big deal. And so um, we've been talking about getting the incentive structures right interdisciplinary collaboration, cross-institution collaboration for a long, long time. And I'll, I'll give you some thoughts on how we can do better. The science policy gap. Um, this is another kind of silo, right? So when we, when we think about silos, we often think about uh, silos between disciplines. And here's this guy saying, my policy manager doesn't understand me. Um, so there's definitely this gap. There's, there's, there's a whole field about this science policy gap, right? There's a whole field of study of why we don't do a better job of translating science to policy, why we don't do a better job of policy asking for science. This, a, a, a meeting like this is meant to sort of overcome that hurdle of narrowing that gap. And it is a bit of a culture clash. Um, I dabbled in this literature a bit this week to see who says what about the science policy gap. And there was a nice piece here about narrowing the gap. And the different kinds of uh, expectations or cultures that we see in the science, science silo versus the government silo around probabilities accepted, certainties desired. That's one contrast. Um, problem oriented, service oriented. Innovation prize, innovation is suspect. Um, replication is essential, beliefs are situational. Um, you know, when we sit down with our colleagues from government, uh, often what stymies my conversations is often that it, someone yelled out goals are different, right? The goals within our institutions over here are often quite different than the goals, for example, in the state or federal government. Uh, the clientele is very different. Um, the, the culture of discovery is very different. The time frames are hugely different, right? So I'll sit down with Mike, or I'll sit down with David Mears, or I'll sit down with Pat Ferry, and, We'll hatch, a, hatch an idea to, to do some work together, and I'll be like, great, sounds like a PhD student, you know, we'll get him here. Uh, he or she will work, you know, first year classes, second year proposal, defense, third year, fourth year. By year five, we'll have the answer for you. <laughs> and Mike will say, uh, yeah, I, I actually need this answer like in, in a month or two. Um, <laughs> so the, um, the, the disconnect there is often very, very real and something to keep track of. The objective distance kind of excuse, right, is, is really a big one. Um, you know, that, that this sort of notion that academics are this sort of, this well of unbiased objectivity, right, and that, uh, you know, we, we have to stay clear of the policy process because we don't want to sort of be seen as having bias um, this is a big challenge for uh, moving things forward, for solving problems. Um, if, if we're the so-called <laughs> experts on things, and we study these things and know the most about them, then, and, and yet we don't, um, we don't ourselves get engaged in political processes, decision-making processes, public processes, um, that can be a huge, huge reason for not collaborating to begin with, and a huge reason for not moving things forward. Something that we all struggle with, you know, where is that line between uh, research and advocacy, between research and action, um, that I think a group like this should struggle with um, day to day, month to month, year to year. This relates to um, a two cultures problem. Uh, C.P. Snow's two cultures, I think, is alive and well. C.P. Snow was a British uh, physicist and novelist who gave this lecture in 1959 that later was published as the book, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Re Revolution. And his whole thesis was that the intellectual life of Western society was sort of split into these two cultures, the sciences and the humanities, or the sciences and the literary culture. And he goes through in his lecture and talks about sort of being at dinner parties with the upper crust of, of, of Britain of the time and of the, the literary culture, the politicians, the business owners, the movers and shakers in society, 
who had absolutely sort of no sense of modern science whatsoever, right? They might, might as well have been Neolithic cavemen, right, when it came to their understanding of physical principles of how the biophysical universe worked. Yet these were the literate, these were the elites, these were the sort of uh, high society types who knew that they were very knowledgeable and went to college and had degrees and were very successful. I think this two cultures problem is, is very much alive and well, both on campuses, um, between these silos, um, but also between um, different kinds of intellects and different folks with different powers and different privileges in society. Um, so let's pick on Congress. Um, so here's the sort of education background of, of Congress and sort of separating out the, the non-STEM disciplines, right? A little over 10% of Congress has some STEM background. And then when you dive into committees, committees that are responsible for science, for example, or using science to inform policy, you can get scared. <coughs> Sometimes on those committees, you don't have any folks with any science background whatsoever. Um, 93% of the House and 99% of the Senate do hold bachelors today. That's changed a lot, actually, so, so, so that's good news. But what, what their degrees in are largely in these non-STEM, non-science disciplines. It's not to sort of say that the social science side is not relevant, but a lot of social science education in fields like economics, my field, um, like some of the humanities, really don't um, ask our students to sort of burden themselves with a science-based understanding of the world. And that's a real challenge and a disconnect between these two cultures. Um, when so, so many folks uh, are studying government and law, as you would expect them to in, in, as politicians, um, but really don't have a, a, a good grounding in physics, chemistry, biology, how the, how the natural world works. That's, that's a big challenge for not collaborating more across disciplines and between institutions. And a, lot, a lot to do with the distrust, the emerging distrust, the rapidly growing distrust of the science enterprise amongst decision makers. And of course, the first one that was yelled at by my colleague Jen was just all too busy, right? <laughs> We're just too damn busy to collaborate. Um, and I, I think that's a question of priorities. I think we're going to have to somehow flip that on its head. Um, and I, I look to the leadership, the leadership within our schools and colleges and universities, the leadership in our state and federal government organizations, to look back up the list, make us uncomfortable, get the incentives right, uh, stop saying, you know, yeah, more study, more study, and then we'll make a decision. Uh, get folks who are the experts on committees, on panels, giving testimony, part of teams, looking at policy. Um, we're really not too busy, we're just busy doing things that maybe aren't as important as collaboration. So let me, let me loop this back to building a forest research network that I was asked to talk about. Um, and, and visit this list, right, because I think when you look at building a forest research network, we could use all of these excuses, right? We collaborate a lot already. Look at this room, the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative, all the years of collaboration. What do you want from us, right? We're collaborating a lot already. Um, you know, the breadth, the breadth, depth trade-off, the more study required, um, the more money, just give us more money and we'll, we'll tell you what you need to know. The objective distance problem, we've got a lot of data, we've got a lot of expertise, do we put that to good use in solving problems? The two cultures issue, really encourage to see the Vermont Monitoring Cooperative really start to try to pull in the social data Try to pull in the data and the studies, which is really at the heart of the, how you make a decision, not just the information that you use to make those decisions, and the too busy issue. So let's, let's, let's turn these into um, <coughs> genuine positive opportunities <coughs> to collaborate. Let, let's get beyond these excuses. Um, let's turn, we collaborate enough already, into, well, if that's true, then prove it. Let's show genuine collaboration. Jen said some of that in her opening remarks, where the collaboration comes up front, right? Where we collaborate together in, de in defining the research goals, writing the grants, doing the proposals, putting together um, the ideas. Um, very often, and I've been a part of dozens and dozens of, of collaborative grant writing teams, 
And the very last thing you do the night before the grant is, is due is you start sprinkling that grant with your stakeholders, right? It's like, man, this is really bad practice. And we all know this, and we all say we don't have enough time, and the collaboration will happen, just trust us. But we have to do better of creating structures, and they might be just the proposal vetting writing structures, where the collaboration comes up front, where folks feel like they're actually part of the team, and not just the sort of uh, sitting back waiting for the answers from the so-called experts. <coughs> um, I discovered a new word on the web, so I was preparing for this. Co, wait, can I even pronounce it? Co-opetition. <laughs> so let's take the best of competition and the best of cooperation and, and, and put them together. Competition's good, right? It, 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 make, it makes us honest and it, and it, and it avoids you know, being lazy. Um, but let's get cooperative teams together and have the teams compete with one another. Um, let's move towards collaborative proposal development, but have it be in a kind of competitive environment. Um, let's uh, have groups uh, compete in limited competition so that it's not just a free-for-all, but we can kind of put more constraints around the collaborative aspects of, of our proposal writing, of our research building, of our network building, um, but do it in a more cooperative way. We've tried that some this year by uh, uh, really reinventing how the University of Vermont is, is using the McIntyre Stennis Forestry Research Funding, really going towards more of a cooperative, collaborative proposal writing, rather than sort of send out an RFP with all the great language in there about cooperation, collaboration, interdisciplinary work, and then roll the dice and hoping that our PIs will, will do it. Um, we've tried a different approach where we bring all the PIs together from the outset and sort of design proposal teams from the outset. Um, and it's, it's, it's helping. It's helping to move towards a more collaborative, interdisciplinary spirit. Um, we could turn this breadth at the expense of depth into really a new age of synthesis. And we've been talking about this for a long, long time. Very smart people for a very long time have been talking about the importance of generalists, the importance of T-shaped people, the importance of synthesis. When I think of the problem-solving process, right, I have to characterize it as four steps. Problem definition, problem analysis, you take big messy problems, divide them up into their pieces. Problem synthesis, bring the pieces back together, and then communication. Um, speaking just on the behalf of the Academy of Academics, I think we, we do an okay job at problem definition. Um, we do so-so job of analysis, that's how the University is structured into disciplines, into silos, into expertise. We can break big, messy problems up into their pieces. Know more and more and more about less and less and less until we know everything about nothing, something like that. <laughs> right? We're really good at that. Um, not so good on the synthesis piece, and that's this, this, this stumbling block of collaboration, right? <clears throat> Pulling things back together, and terrible on the communication piece. Um, I think that's where, where we have to, to really hold our own feet to the fire. Um, you know, I, I look to folks like Wilson who think very broadly about the need for synthesis and how to do synthesis, how to break down the barriers that we've listed here against synthesis. And the world is, needs more synthesizers. Right? It needs more fields. It needs more borderland disciplines. It needs more folks who are comfortable crossing that chasm between the natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities. Um, I think that's the only way we're going to be able to use the wealth of data and experience that we have to move forward and solve problems. Um, you know, to get from the more study required critique, I think we got to really create innovation spaces. Business has done this really well, right? Incubators, uh, environments where you reduce risk, right? Where you encourage collaboration, where you reward collaboration, right? Business incubators, uh, co-op structures, I think BMC is a good example of this. Um, uh, you know, social innovation spaces like, like farmers markets, um, social innovation spaces. Um, there's, there's countless examples that I think we could take advantage of in building a force network that looks more like an innovation space. 
Uh, we've got the government players, we've got the university players, maybe we need to do better on pulling in the industry players. Um, we have examples, and we have physical infrastructure to actually do this. This is the one thing we have going for us, right? We have, you know, literally space like here at a campus like UVM, but UVM manages five experimental forests, forests. and we have the, the Jericho Research Forest and the Avid Forestry Lab, and all of these spaces where we could be bringing people together in more active, innovative, incubator kind of ways. And we're, we're talking about how the Jericho Research Forest, for example, could be used in more of that spirit of innovation, incubation, lowering of the walls between research, education, service, etc. Uh, building wisdom, moving from the kind of more study required to building wisdom. Uh, the other part of the E.O. Wilson quote that I didn't share with you is the first sentence. We are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. Um, I, I think this has never been more true. Um, I, I look at the wonderful work that the BMC has done in pulling together all of this historical data and, uh, and the accessibility to databases of BMC, Hubbard, Brook, NSF, LTR sites, the NEON network. My lord, we have a lot of information. But I think we're lacking in the wisdom because we don't collaborate and we don't cut across disciplines. Um, the science policy gap, um, I think, excuse me, group, the group incentives, I think we have to move away from this individualistic culture towards more group incentives. You'd be really surprised how easy it actually is to get folks to come together as groups on a campus like ours. We just provide some food. <laughs> show up. And then if you provide food and money, like a lot of people show up, right? <laughs> That's all we did with this McIntyre Stennis thing is, is Kate helped me reorganize how we did the process and Kate said, just food and money and they'll, they'll show up and she was right. Um, I, you know, we can create group incentives to really make the groups come together and gel. I think there's some great experiences out there that we could benefit from here in Vermont. The, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis out in Santa Barbara is a fantastic example of bringing folks together with just a little bit of money and a little bit of food to get people together in a space together and watch the magic happen. And some of the great synthesis papers that have been published in Science and Nature over the last 20 years have come out of these types of experiences. There's a new one down in Annapolis that I've, I've participated in uh, called Succinct. It's a, a social ecological synthesis center that's doing the same kinds of things. Very low amounts of resources, but really, really, really high return. I think we could do something similar in a forest network here. Um, action research. Um, I think to sort of, <clears throat> we're moving it towards an era of action research, where our research has to have actionable outcomes. I know we'll be talking about that a lot today. This is the frustration when academics like me sit down <coughs> with our state leadership, and there's this time lag, there's this information delay. There's this inability of, of academics like me to step across that boundary and be willing to put myself at risk. Um, that's a very important thing that we just don't have the luxury to be the kind of objective, distant, ivory tower researcher anymore. And action research and all the literature around action research helps us understand the steps forward. Um, We've been very active here at UVM, for example, in building a PAR network, Participatory Action Research, or now they call it CPAR, Community Participatory Action Research. We know how to do this. Um, we just have to do better at breaking down the barriers. Um, the objective distance piece, um, I think for some time we've moved into a, a post-normal science world. Normal science was this kind of value-free, puzzle-solving exercise careful observation, repeatable experiments, refutable hypotheses. Now we're in a world where like the sample size is one, like the Earth, <laughs> and we don't have a lot of time for careful observation. We can't do a repeatable experiment, and um, we, we've got to sort of get beyond ourselves. Um, Post-normal science challenges our notion of who speaks with authority, challenges our notion for what kind of information is needed, is it acceptable to make decisions, how much do you really need to know before you can pull the trigger. 
and challenges our notion for how, how much information is enough. The two cultures problem is, is um, once we get farther down the list, these get harder and harder. Um, I, I think we're, we're seeing a new vision for education in the Anthropocene. This Anthropocene concept is really taking hold, where we don't live in the Holocene anymore. We live in the Anthropocene. We live in a geologic epic that humans have defined, that humans have influenced, that, have we, that were, was ushered in at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, where the real problem of humanity is that we have these sort of paleolithic emotions, <coughs> right? We're all still kind of cavemen and cave women at, at our very heart. We have medi medieval institutions that were developed hundreds of years ago, um, and we have godlike technology. Um, the Anthropocene is going to require different solutions than the ones that made the best to begin with. Um, and this is probably our biggest challenge of coming to terms with the Anthropocene. We've been a part of a big new consortium of universities between the University of Vermont, the Gill University in Montreal, and York University in Toronto of pulling together a program of research, education, and outreach called Economics for the Anthropocene, where we'll be training a new generation of leaders, of doctoral students, who will then go out and run state organizations, run the nonprofits, lead departments and programs, um, and we're asking those PhD students to first and foremost embed themselves in an organization outside of the university. So the partners in this big grant include the state of Vermont on the Vermont side, include the Lake Champlain Research Consortium, include um, the Vermont Natural Resources Council, and, but then also include Vermont Public Interest Research Group, Conservation Law Foundation, uh, the Energy Action Network, we're really trying to sort of use our students and this training experience to bridge these divides intentionally from the outset, right? Where we embed our doctoral students in the organizations that are pushing for change and they need the horsepower to do it. And I think we can do better. Uh, and then the last one about no time, I mean, that's all true. There's no time, there's no money, and there's, there's scarce resources, but that's, to me, it's just about changing priorities. Yes, we're busy, but busy doing what, right? Um, I think um, we've been very clever of trying to change priorities and share in resources. Um, we have joint positions now at UVM between UVM and the US Forest Service. Um, we, we have a long tradition of joint positions with the, the co-op unit, our wildlife co-op unit. Um, we've been more thoughtful about how to stretch research resources across uh, departments, across colleges, between universities and uh, the private and public sector. Um, I mean, this organization here is, is the state and UVM and the Forest Service all chipping in for a, a monitoring cooperative. We need more of that. Um, we've got folks leading new projects that are bridging the gap between the university and the, and the state of Vermont. Uh, Dr. Manning's leading a project around recreation, working intently with the state of Vermont. Dr. Ricketts at the Gun Institute is working with the state of Vermont on, on flood, floodplain resilience. Um, the, the Gun Institute's work on the genuine progress indicator. It's kind of a new era of collaboration, and it feels that way, and it's because we're changing the priorities. And it's because of budget cuts, and it's because of shrinking resources that's forcing us to collaborate. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, if there is a, a, an upside to budget cuts, the upside is, is collaboration. So I'm encouraged to see that. So we come back to the title. Um, I think we have the ingredients in place to make this happen. A more vibrant, a more compelling, a more societal changing Vermont Forest Research Network. The ingredients include um, resources of universities and colleges across across the state of Vermont that are incredible hubs. Just here at UVM, we have the U.S. Forest Service co-located in the Aiken Building, the co-op unit, UVM Extension, our, our forest properties, our laboratory facilities, great spaces like the Davis Center. I mean, what more do you want? I mean, we have all of the sort of assets for collaboration. We do collaborate, and it's, it's really about getting the incentives right to collaborate more, and not just more, but more effectively. Um, we have long-term data, and very often we don't need more data to answer some of these questions. We just need to work with the data sets that we have. 
and start cutting across this chasm between the social and the natural, and really using new kinds of integrative lenses to analyze the data that we have. We have willingness in this state, especially, and in also the federal people embedded in this state, to collaborate. Um, the fact that our senior leadership is here from ANR is hugely encouraging, right? And a huge opportunity for us all to speak with them over the next few hours about collaborative opportunities. And then finally, building a forest resource network. We're this little dinky state called Vermont, right? If we couldn't do it here, my lord, where else could we pull this off, right? So I hope we roll our sleeves up and get to work today. Thank you very much. We uh, probably have time for a couple questions for uh, Dean Erickson. If uh, any questions. Yes. Uh, okay. yeah. um, I would submit, and just for fun for this group here, that what may be needed to support Forest Research Network is a forest observation network, where the research questions are answered by a broad functional monitoring system that allows us to track the conditions of our forest over time. And I would add to that things like air and things like water and things like soil. Yeah, and I think that, that, I mean, that forces collaboration, right? When you cut across those mediums, uh, I think that's really important. I think when you look at our big institutions, like look at the EPA and how it's carved itself, itself up into all these mediums, that discourages collaboration. And in an age of climate change, biodiversity loss, massive global scale environmental problems, we can't afford that kind of silization of the mediums anymore. So, yeah, I would encourage that. You know, I should say when you look at that, Top 10 list of excuses. Um, a guy like Hal Bogleman, he, he's, he's, he's one of those characters who, who, every single one of those excuses, he found a way around them. Every single one. And it's the reason why we have you know, the, the limited collaboration that we have today is because of folks who never use those as excuses. Yes, one more. Yeah, I, I, I worry about that isolation, and, you know, and I worry about, for example, the lack of the forest industry presence at a, at a meeting like this. Um, I, I think we need to create these safe zones for professionals, non-professionals, our students who, who really benefit the most out of mixing it up with folks, get, get them away from their professors. I mean, that, that's a really good, good thing. Um, I, I, you know, the conversations we've been having, for example, around the Jericho Research Forest is why not have that be an incubator? Why not have that be a place where, where professionals and non-professionals alike can come out for weekend walks in the forest, can come out and mix it up with the state forester, can come out and, 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 and use their own experience and their perspectives and meet with our students and the next generation of landowners and decision makers. We've done that to some extent at Jericho with the Green Forestry Initiative. Uh, we do that with Saturday walks out of Jericho. Every first Saturday, there's a walk, and we invite people far and wide. Um, so it's, it's a question of doing that more effectively, and more intentful, and maybe deprioritizing some of the other things that we do and putting it more towards these very effective. Great, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks, Steve.